Thanks, Todd. I came to my first CNU, uh, that was probably about 30 years ago. And there's that moment when you have at, this, at the CNU where you're looking around with America and you're like, how did they do it to this place? Like, is it really still happening 25 years, 25 years later? Maybe it is. Um, I'm not going to criticize one way or another what shape we're in, but more talk about how we got there, what are the policies that are there, what's, what's being subsidized. We tend to think of subsidies, we tend to think of the government handout, I'm giving you a check for something. But there's a lot of subsidies that are just baked into the system, that are policies that are, that are hiding in plain sight that we're just not asking questions about. And it, there is a suburban bias that built into policies. So this actually goes back in time to before the CNU. This is a quote from Ian McCarg from 1969. That most complete conjunction of land capacity and human delusion, the subdivision. Right? So this is something that we've been with. We know the cost of sprawl. In 1973, the Nixon administration published this document on the cost of sprawl. It's there. This data is there. We've known this for 40 years. Why is it not taking or changing shape? How is this not happening? So our firm specializes in some scary math. It's like fifth grade division, basically. And we do analysis to, to do comparative analysis of urbanism versus suburbanism. And the data is there to show you what we all know, that urban environment produces more wealth. There's the information, right? And a lot of people think sometimes wrongly that I'm criticizing Walmart. And I'm just going to tell you, I went to a, the International Association of Tax Assessing Officers conference which makes this conference look like Bernie Man by comparison. <laughs> it's very strong. They're, they're great people, but they're doing math. They're figuring out what the values are. At 8 o'clock in the morning, this guy was presenting to 2,000 assessors in the room, and he was showing spreadsheet after spreadsheet on how cheap his buildings were. And I'm thinking, this is awesome. He's getting all his tax bills lower than one meeting. Assessors are agnostic. If the building's not worth anything, it's got low value, right? Therefore, it's paying less taxes. Now, I roll up to the microphone and ask them in the questions, like during the Q&A, I said, Mr. Terrell, what's the useful life of one of your buildings? And he said, 15 years. We'll be out of that building in 15 years. We design it on a depreciable cycle to depreciate as fast as possible. We get a new, new building to depreciate it again. That's it. That's the magic of our tax system. Don't hate the player, hate the game. Understand what the game is. So I just want you all to realize that the average Walmart has a lifespan of a household cat. So, <laughs> We were talking about this earlier. At least we care about the cat and the cat died. We weren't. So, but that's the tax system. And we need to understand that at a local level because we're operating corporations called cities. This is straight out of Oxford American Dictionary. It says to constitute a company, a city, or other organization is a legal corporation. So the city's incorporated. It sits inside a county that's incorporated. It sits inside a state that's incorporated. And hell, Joe Biden said it. Our country's a corporation. And if any attorneys in the audience want to look this up, it's uh, U.S. Uh, Code Title 28, if you want to read it. The federal corporations, what we are. This has to cash flow. So the city is a finite boundary of land that has to be managed. It's just a really big real estate development project that we elect a board of directors to manage. And, and CEOs understand the cash flow. Paul Allen is like uh, one and a quarter times the, the, the value of my city. Does my mayor understand the potency of, Walmart, of, of Microsoft. And this gets back to the numbers of, of how of we should be looking at the data and how we're making decisions. And my favorite book about this is Moneyball. And then in the beginning of the book, Michael Lewis compares the Yankees against the, uh, the Oakland Athletics. And when you have that kind of salary for the Yankees, yes, you can now compete against the Oakland Athletics and buy talent, right? He called it an unfair game. And, and the reality was the Oakland Athletics had, they couldn't compete at the salary level, so they started making other decisions. They looked at other data, right? So let's look, let's look at how this plays out. So the, uh, the A's had a salary of $41 million. They won 103 games uh, in, in that year. The Texans had 72 wins, yet they were spending more. So just by spending money doesn't necessarily mean you're getting talent, nor creating value, right? So the A's, or the, the, the Rangers, were spending 255% more money, yet they were only winning 70% winning of what the A's were winning. There's data there. Now the crazy thing about this is that this, this is all uh, Sabre metrics in a $6.2 billion industry. Michael Lewis says baseball is a $6.2 billion industry operating without mathematics. It would take from 1971 to 2004 when the, when the 
Red Sox finally figured out that they could do what the A's were doing, and they won a pennant, right? We've been doing this for 25 years, and we're still frustrated that people, it's still not the paradigm of what's going on in the, in the world in the United States. It takes time for things to change. So, um, sorry, the clicker's a little slow. The main point is cities are gonna need to behave more like the A's going forward. We don't have the large S that the Yankees have. We're not all dominant cities. Your hometown doesn't have the capital or resources that New York City has. You have to play it smart. You have to make better decisions. You have to look at different data. So as a baseball team, my city, the city of Asheville, is worth $12.8 billion. My city is twice the value of Major League Baseball in total. Who does my city behave like? Do they behave like Manhattan, or do they behave hard, hard like the A's, or do they behave like the Yankees? And I know Julie's in the audience, one of my counselors. I'm not going to state which one we are, but we're going to leave that out there. Um, so speaking of Asheville, we talk about cities and buildings like a product. They're crops that grow in the land. They have a productive value. When a farmer looks at uh, a farm, a farmer is making an economic call on which to grow. So if you look at this, the tax productivity model of my entire county, does anybody want to guess where downtown Asheville is? <laughs> if we're to lay a millage rate across this thing like a blanket, what's the cash flow that's coming out of that downtown? Now we see that the downtown is not only potent, but it's, it's not just heads and shoulders above everything else, it's leaps and bounds above everything else. And this is for an entire county. That wealth is there. So analyzing the city inside the county, the city only takes up 6% of the land area of my entire county, yet it's producing 41% of the county's property taxes. My brothers and sisters out in the county are receiving handsome amounts of money from my city. We're all in this together, but we're producing that wealth for them, right? So to think of the productivity level, my city is like a one to seven ratio of productivity in the county. So imagine having 100 staff selling stuff, but one person selling seven times everybody else. That's productive. But the downtown is also part of the county as well, right? The downtown barely shows up in the county's footprint, yet it's producing 2% of the wealth of, of property taxes for my county. Now that may not look like much, but when you run the productivity on that, that's a one to 31 ratio. So what was, if you think the city was impressive, downtown is killing it in county taxes. That's data that's there that's showing us who's the efficient player, who's the one that's got the highest on base average. This goes back to Ian McCarter again in 1969 in Design with Nature. He wrote this, we tend to think of this as an environmental book, but when you read the book, he actually talks about uh, we, have, we have built one explicit model of the world is built upon economics. Money is our measure. So it behooves us to actually measure that money and show it to our elected officials, show it to uh, fellow people in the community, and, and see the data that's there to become better performers. As we go forward in the next 25 years, we need to figure out what kind of baseball team we're going to be, who's going to be more efficient, how we're going to have more winners. You're either going to start going forward and be successful, or you're going to be left behind. We see this in industry. So that's one of my other points. I promised Nathan I'd write all of these things down, so that <laughs> works up here. Does this work in my city? Does it work in the Rust Belt? We see the same thing. We see in Buffalo. Guess where downtown is? This is a Rust Belt town, a town that's collapsing. We can see the core of the city is the producer. This is both property taxes plus retail taxes. Downtown's killing it. In the Sun Belt as well. Um, this, is, this is Austin, Texas. Anybody want to guess where downtown Austin is? Boom, right? So we can bring everything we want to talk about the city, but the data is there that we can, we can show and have better decisions. So if we just get agnostic about the, what's going on in the city, strip down the data and make a decision, we can have, we can have better, better decision making. It also plays in Peoria. Um, we did a study in Peoria, did the economics, and there was a couple of things that we started noticing as a trend in Peoria. Red is surface parking lot, by the way, this image. Black is buildings. So let's just look at this as a product of, of wealth creation. When I put a street down as a city, I'm activating real estate, right? That real estate is supposed to pay taxes to cover that street. How do people improve the land by either buildings or parking? Oh, we had to make the uh, model relevant for Peoria because they make Caterpillar tractors there. So um, you got your parking, you got your building. When the assessor goes out there, the assessor's like, all right, well, the building's worth about 35 bucks a square foot, the parking's worth $1.50. So think of that for a second. If you're taxing the same rate, everything's taxed at six mils or whatever. One object is 35 bucks, one object is a dollar fifty. So the buildings are 35, let's call 34 times more potent than parking. Or we're giving a 30 times subsidy 
to that parking. We're letting you pay less taxes to put down parking. So we measured it. The reason why the models look the way they do, this is no rocket science. Once, it, once, once you get past the density and start decreasing your building footprint and adding more parking, the model drops down. It's the parking that's doing that. You look out at suburbia, you see it's a lot flatter. What's a lot flatter? Because there's a lot more parking up there. So we measured it. Taking the whole entire county, doing the same thing. This is the land area of the entire Peoria County. If you took all the buildings and shoved them together, this is the building that you, you've created as a footprint for the entire county. That's all the land you need for all the buildings in Peoria County. Well, guess what? The parking lot is actually bigger than all the buildings for all the parking lots side by side. And you got these things called roads. You have to pay for these, right? So when you look at the numbers of this, you see that this, the buildings, less square, square miles, more value, parking, 40 million in production. This is a cost. You have to pay for the roads, right? And then you have everything else, berms, buffers, backyards, farms, whatever, non-improvement. So the numbers are there. The roads, if you put them end to end, will stretch from Peoria to Vancouver. They have to rebuild this stuff. Every American city is going through this. And we've noticed other things, speaking of Vancouver, Canadians are awesome. We need to learn more about what's happening in other communities. They make different decisions about land use, and with it, you see the value created in the whole community. Um, we, we did a project in New Zealand. Notice, this is Auckland, notice the density in downtown Austin, uh, uh, Auckland, let me see if this gets work right there. And you see a TOD, you can see the corridors that have density, and the model reflects that density, that value is there, like a mountain range of wealth created in the community. We can learn this from other places. Sorry, the clicker there. Oops. So another lesson is this proportion of land use has to change. We can't just have all this parking. It's, it, and that's going to be how to pay for these streets, too. You can have all the driverless cars you want. If you can't afford the streets, they're not going to be able to use them, right? So that's all. So just to drill in a little case study, we just finished Redlands, California, home of Esri Software, which is the software we use for this stuff, GIS software. Notice this little spike right here. What was kind of amazing about that spike is this is the, this is the most productive building in the entire community. A little two-story building. And there's lots of lessons in Redlands. So basically that little shoe shop up there, if you had three acres out of the shoe shop, it would equal the 12-acre Walmart. Again, apples to apples, pound for pound. That little shoe shop is killing it. Um, this is kind of amazing. These buildings are two blocks away from each other in downtown. And who would have thought that this building is actually more productive than that building? And if you drive by these things, you'd never think that. But the data's there, the numbers are there that shows you that. But the, the really interesting lesson is what they did to their downtown. They dropped a mall into it. The mall is, is pretty much seen better days. And um, uh, Josh was doing this model. He's like, well, let's see if we just, if we can hit delete on the mall and go back in time and get the sandworm maps, then we reproduce the value. So he, this is where the mall dropped in, so he measured all those buildings. Uh, this is where the mall currently is producing about $5 million of total value. If the mall were in incred incredible shape, it'd top out at about $10 million. But if you, have, if you didn't tear those buildings down, you'd be at $21 million. Let's put this side by side for a second. Why would you throw away value? This is what happens when we, when we hammered the city, when we did a renewal. So again, that's another lesson. We need to make America great again. If we could just <laughs> hit undo. Um, Other cities, I mean, Charleston's actually one of the, it's like the most European of cities that we've studied in America. And again, the data shows that you can clearly see where downtown is. You see, certainly you see the value of the beachfront, but look what's happening with urbanism. Um, there's a lot of lessons in Charleston that we learned. Uh, this was actually a fun one. Just, just, just for fun, we grabbed all the buildings that predate the Declaration of Independence. They have old buildings there, so anything born before 1776. Here's a building built in 1686. That's clearly a revolutionary right there. But here's all the buildings. Let's just go ahead and assemble them. There they are on a map. Those buildings are about uh, 21 acres of, of footprint in the community. Last year, they wrote a check to the county and county property taxes for $631,000. Well, there's also a Walmart in town. That Walmart is, is about 21 acres. Last year, the Walmart wrote a check for $47,000. That Walmart's going to be gone in, in 15 years. 
Again, there's a perverse incentive built in the system for me to produce a low value building in your community and pay you low taxes on top of that. You've got buildings, on the other hand, that have shown you for, for 240 years they've produced wealth. These are the humble rules of, of, of arithmetic. If you just do the math on this stuff, you'll see the value. Now, that's just the buildings. Turning the buildings off and only looking at the dirt, with the value of the dirt. So there's no buildings in this model, and we see the value of the beach. You understand beachfront real estate is worth a lot of money. But look at the downtown. You can see that value there. Turning the model and facing the ocean, we see this. This is ION. This is a DPZ design community that was built, what, 20 years ago? You guys did it? Um, you know, there you go, Andreas. You're God. You've created beachfront real estate right there. That's, that's the value of your design. The work that you all do creates wealth in those, commun in those communities. And uh, Charles asked us, so like, well, could you take this vacant piece of land? It's actually, right now, it's a, it's a, it's a landfill that's been completely ready for redevelopment. So zero tax dollars of value. Um, and could you project forward with new development would produce? So this is, a, again, another dwelling pictures I've ever designed. We measured it. That's an eight-story building, and it steps down to three-story buildings here. So when you, when you drop this development, and this is the new value you create, $2.4 billion of taxable value. So to put that in context, the retail sales produced out of that building, for that property, 200 acres will produce 17% of what that produces in retail sales. Or, if you look at a property tax standpoint, 200 acre development will be almost equal in value to 6,000 acres. When the newspaper journalists saw this, because West Ashley folks were up in arms about the city paying attention to this development, he said, well, the question shouldn't be whether or not West Ashley gets its fair share of taxes back. The question should be, does West Ashley carry its fair share? Boom. That's the doubt. <laughs> So good design is the solution for harvesting wealth. Design produces wealth in your community. Um, we did a project with Chuck in Strong Towns, and we used the Strong Towns methodology. This is an inside joke for those of us, for those of you that know the Taco John story, <coughs> orderly but dumb. Orderly but dumb does have to go. But here's, in Lafayette, Louisiana, several of you have seen this. We did a full cost benefit analysis of the city. So here's the revenue coming out of the ground. Here's the, uh, just measuring pavement, all the roads. The red is the liability of all the roads that they currently own. Blue is the revenue. Do you have enough revenue to pay for your liability? Now here's the scary part, because they already don't have money, they've gone out to the bond market, they're taking out bonds, and, which is a loan, right? You have to pay the bond back. Half of their revenue is already committed to debt service on the bonds of the red stuff. We, we uh, showed that, and one of the counselors freaked out. This is what he said to us. He's like, it's not about where you live, it's about what you believe. I believe I'm six foot tall and I have full head of hair. <laughs> so the public works director responded to this by saying, by saying this, there's no such thing as an infrastructure ferry, so we have, we have a Photoshop Kevin in this. And doing the model on this, we went ahead and sent everybody a bill for where they live. So this, this, you know, well, let's go ahead and talk about the politics for a second. Right or left, this isn't a Republican or a Democratic issue. We see it on both sides of the argument. The bills have to be paid. We have to get past that. This is going to be um, a, a challenge in any community to talk about this stuff. Uh, but this is the, we sent everybody a bill to the side view of the city, netting the, the costs against the revenues, what's in the black, what's in the red, here's the whole thing in 3D, slapping this thing on the ground, this is what you get. And they told me, they're like, well, people really want to live out there. I'm like, yeah, that's what you're paying them to move out there, right? They're upside down that much. You're getting the money from the green and transferring it to the red. That's called a subsidy. Account for it. You know, this isn't invisible market forces. If you're paying me that infrastructure, I'm going to consume it. So let's let's kind of make it simple. In 1950, they had uh, 334,000 people, five feet of pipe per person, 2.4 fire hydrants. They've grown their population to 121,000. They've grown their feet of pipe per person to this. And their fire hydrants per thousand in population, they had a thousand and two thousand percent growth in liability. They told us that they got rich. We measured that. So their wealth had gone from twenty-seven thousand to one hundred to uh, forty-five thousand. So it's one hundred and sixty percent growth in minimum revenue. So you've grown your wealth one hundred and sixty percent. You've grown your liability a thousand percent, two thousand percent. Does this work out? You have to pay for this stuff. But this is an American paradigm, this hope that it's eventually going to get paid for by, by somebody else or something. 
But these bills are coming due. We're experiencing this. We have to put these bills on the table and talk about them. We have to move past these kind of fantasy conversations into the data. You know, George Bush nailed it. Like, it's kind of weird that I miss him now, but um, <laughs> but we had, he said we, we have an addiction of oil, but really, let's be honest about it. This is an addiction of suburbia. I don't have to see my neighbor. I've got a big yard. It's really nice. Andreas is right. We, this has become a market preference. Well, let's put the numbers on the table to understand this stuff, all the policies and the subsidies that are out there. So all of this stuff, like I said, is hiding in plain sight. These are just assessors' files that we're using. It's just data inside government budgets. It's all there. Back 25 years ago, these folks took courage and risk to step out and talk about these things. The average age of folks in this picture are what, 35 years old? You know, they created a movement that we're all now working with. We need to keep this fight going forward. And what's crazy is a lot of this stuff seems like common sense to us, but it's not common sense once we leave this building, and we need to continue that argument and that fight. But I just want to close with, uh, with the behavior side of this thing. To move the mouse, you need to move the cheese, but you need to understand the human side of the behavior issues that are here. Even Steve Ballmer gets it. You can't just put facts out there. Facts are important, but we have to deal with the human behavior. And there's a, there's a quirk that we all have called delayed discounting. And it's the habit that we will push further costs further into the future. The, the further into the future it is, the smaller it feels to us. If you want to know an example of this, go find a 20-year-old smoking cigarettes outside. Ask that person if they're going to get cancer. What are they going to say? I'm not addicted. I'm going to quit when I'm 40. I'm going to be that one 80-year-old that I know that still smokes. This is a, a behavioral quirk that we have. So we make that cancer real in the image. Show people how they're bleeding. Show you the heart attack. You have to feel this to, to, change, to change policy. Another thing that I raised uh, two days ago, you know, we have to keep this in balance. Now, now surely, it's like, you can't just will the, the, the suburban sprawl away. It's, that's, that's not going to happen, let's be realistic. But you have to keep it in balance. You need to understand how much of it you can absorb. Do the math on that to see what you're going to subsidize. And uh, Josh has a term he's actually got on his business card. We have the geo accountant. You know, your accountant doesn't care if you buy a boat. <laughs> but your accountant cares if you can afford the boat, right? But make those choices if you can afford it. If you can afford a boat, do it. If you can afford the sprawl, all right, just keep it in check. We also have to understand tax policies. Our country was formed on a tax revolt, right? We should understand this stuff. Our tax policies need to change. Moses didn't deliver them to us, right? So, put simply, you make a cheap building, you pay lower taxes, period. Is that creating wealth for you all? Is that creating a place you want to live in? Is that the priority that we want to have? Throw away buildings, go for it. Talk about it. Let's, have, let's talk about this in your community. We can change our zoning codes like we change our underwear, but we can't change tax policy. Come on now. So let's see if the clicker works. So just to close, the fundamental issue that we, that, that we have right now is that inefficient land use costs more than efficient land use. It's that simple. So you put, you put more stuff out there, it's going to cost more to maintain it. Measure it. It's that simple. Do your math. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. We have time for about five minutes for questions, or complaints, <laughs> or challenges. Right here. Right here. The question is, does the valuation work for both the cost approach and the income approach? Yes. Um, I mean, I don't know, what do you mean by works on that? Right. As far as the values that you have in, in these, uh, these models, I mean, the cost approach, I can see that in, uh, when you're valuing, valuing real estate, but when you go to the income approach, it's more of how much are you making on the property that determines the value. So, well, not necessarily. So, what ends up happening, how real estate, um, Get some feedback here. How, how the real estate valuation market works, they don't, the, the assessors don't decide what happens in the marketplace until somebody transacts. Once you or I purchase in the marketplace, that sets value because somebody's made a purchase. Um, so that's how our valuation happens, and the assessors do the math countywide to come up with your assessed value. Your taxes are on top of that. Just 
It's real simple. It's the mathematics of millage rate times your value. That's your tax bill. Um, the, the perverse weird thing is, why should that matter versus the cost of the street in front of you? When you go to the store, when you, when you buy um, a soda, don't you think Coca-Cola is figuring out the cost of that product? And that's what goes to the retail price of the market. We don't run cities that way. We're operating off 17th century tax policies. And we just hope that it works out. Maybe that worked in the 1700s, but now we're seeing that it doesn't work. Because the financial industries have figured out how to exploit the loopholes in the policy. So again, don't hate Walmart. They just figured out that they're not being charged for the, for the road. A typical Walmart's property taxes, there was a, there was a story that came out um, in an Asheville newspaper just two months ago where it said, downtown Asheville leads in crime. And so we did the math on this to figure out number two in leading in crime is Walmart. Well, how do you compare a Walmart against downtown? And when you do the numbers on it, basically Walmart, the property taxes that it pays, consumes all of its police services with its property taxes. And so far, the way the numbers work, it looks like we're actually giving Walmart an additional $100,000 a year of police services on top of all of their property taxes. It's a subsidy. We have time for one more question. Yeah, so yes, um, cheap buildings pay lower taxes, but how about surfing surface parking lots in downtown <coughs> pay even lower? I discovered a year or two ago that the parking lot across from one of our new higher um, multi-story buildings in downtown Portland um, paid seven times less in taxes than the uh, larger one. Yeah. My solution and suggestion in our uh, West Quadrant plan was to um, actually tax the land instead of the building. Yes, yeah. that's, that's My like... friend uh, Rick Rybeck uh, has a website, Just Economics, yeah. where he has done multiple studies of this thing. Yeah, Rick's, Rick's done good work on this. Joe Courtright right in Portland has done great work. And I'd, I'd recommend uh, the, the, the Lincoln Land Institute. They have a policy Henry George promoted in the 1800s, which is exactly what you just talked about. Yeah. That's great stuff. Yeah. Thank you very much, Thank Joe. You. Thank you for Let me start by introducing Paul Crabtree, whom I met personally only a few months ago on a DBZ charrette. He's a civil engineer whose focus is work on the integration of intelligent urban infrastructure with new urban urban and smart growth planning. He's the founder and president of Crabtree Group and a leader of the Congress of New Urbanism Rainwater Initiative, as well as an author and lecturer on sustainable infrastructure from water to transportation. He's a founding member of the Transec Codes Council and a contributing author of Sustainable and Resilient Cities. Uh, now, I also have the pleasure of introducing Andre Stuani. The last time I did that, uh, it was among a group of friends, as it usually is, at Seaside, and I said, and now a man who needs no introduction, and I really stepped aside. Uh, but I really don't want to do him that disservice here at the 25th Congress. Andre's obviously one of the founders. Uh, but more importantly, a person who believes that information should be free, he has put broadcast and made public more information, more systems, more technological tools for repairing our, uh, our built environment than anyone I know. He also, many of us in this room owe a great debt and gratitude for, to him for our companies because he has, from the very beginning, curated very carefully the teams that were assembled for the early DPZ charrettes which bled over to the other charrettes that other uh, accomplished planners would use. And many of us owe the, the breadth of our experience and the, and the quality of our experience to Andres's generosity, careful curation, and finely tuned bullshit meter. <laughs> Please welcome Andres Swanee and Paul. Thank you uh, for a really great introduction. That was actually excellent, thanks. Uh, one of the things that uh, Todd was uh, trying to get after is, what are we going to do up here? 
you know, Paul and I and kind of looked at it and said, oh, uh, what do you do? What do I do? And I was thinking how to explain it. And there's one old way of saying it from Jorge Luis Borges who said, we have one of these peculiar male friendships that begins by avoiding intimacies and eventually dispenses with conversation altogether. <laughs> I don't know. We hang out together and figure things out and sort of mug people every once in a while. And uh, that's kind of what we're going to do now. But there is an important thing about Paul. He's a, he is an exceptionally good engineer, and it deserves saying that he doesn't, he's such a good engineer, he doesn't go by the book. He actually understands the principles. And as a consequence, uh, very often, he actually saves a great deal of money in the, uh, and he is a, really the lean urbanist civil engineer who's always actually sharpening the pencil and saving money, which in the case of infrastructure is enormous. He's also a fantastic researcher, and there are several tables here that, are, uh, that he assembled from complex information, and that's why it's important to have them in case we're asked to explain them. He has a lot of credibility. Um, okay, so the, there are several themes that I've uh, noticed emerging in this Congress. It's, it's been quite interesting, they're recurring themes. Uh, there's a couple that I'm going to bring up again. One is, what is the source of moral authority? There's a kind of ethical overlay here. And then the other one is messaging. And really, the moral authority thing has occurred about four times. And the messaging is all over, all over the place. How do we actually connect? And what I'm speaking about today in, this 25, in the, the 25 year, and I'm really looking forward to 25 years, is the messaging issue, uh, which actually is only tangentially associated with the reality, the messaging. And I'd like to make a proposition by beginning. I don't know if this is my first, my first slide. OK. Uh, just an analogy that was very helpful, and I use it often to explain. How do we get people to buy solar panels? To do what it takes, the extra $8,000, the extra $16,000 that it takes the, uh, to put it in a room. I have met four types of environmentalists. One is the original type, the one that we often imagine we're speaking to, which is the ethical environmentalist. It is the right thing to do because nature deserves the care. And look at the slide of the little polar bear cup. Why would you want to harm that? It's just the right thing to do. It looks like hell, and it costs, but you have to do it anyway. You make the ethical argument. That works in certain majority Calvinist countries <laughs> in Northern Europe. It is not, it doesn't have a great good uptake in America, for whom the recruiting poster said, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's not the same uh, as the, uh, uh, what was nailed indoors in Europe. Uh, the second way is uh, an argument that was actually used by President Obama, which is, it's just business. It's really good business. It saves you money, you can actually sell the stuff, here's the accounting with a little subsidy, why would you want to do it any other way? And there's a lot of Americans for whom that is actually a very welcome message. By the way, these two kinds are incompatible. Then there's a third kind, which is actually very much on the ascendant now, which is called the cool greens. And the cool greens are people that will buy into this so long as it looks great, that it's really well designed. And you will see an awful lot of green stuff, including food, that is very, very good, but it happens also to taste good. You know, lots of uh, clothing, which is uh, made out of God knows what bamboo fiber or whatever, but it, they wouldn't have bought it if it didn't look good. And if it didn't, again, if it scratch your skin, you wouldn't buy it either. The cool greens actually are primarily addressed through architecture. And there's a lot of very good looking, actually, buildings with green all over it, very well designed, that are actually doing the right thing. Downside is that it's hideously expensive to do it. Okay? But basically, if it's well designed and it's good looking, you can get a lot of people to buy these towns. But it's not an example of good looking gray. Um, and the last one is an interesting set, which is you need solar panels 
to bridge the brownouts, the electrical shutdowns, when times get tough. Okay, and we in Florida know that because when we have hurricanes, we don't have electricity for two weeks, and so we get, you know, we get supplements. And so that argument, which is actually the old, actually survivalist argument, we need this stuff, we need the agriculture close to us because when time gets tough. Those are four different arguments. These people don't even like each other. Do you understand? They're all environmentalists, they don't like each other. One and four, everybody's rolling their eye at the other one. And yet, they're all doing the right thing. Absolutely the right thing. The new urbanism has a very long history, and by the way, it has been analyzed through the method of Zimmerman Vogue with incredible precision, as they usually do. You, know, you can analyze anything you want, uh, culturally, the mitigators, the trendsetters, the opportunists, the adapters, the denialists, generational differentiation, hustle demographic, measurable geography, etc. Now, you can either get Todd and Laurie to come in, or you just see what they're wearing. Um, you can more or less figure it out. With a little conversation, it's fine, but it's very accurate. The metrics are fantastic, what Todd and Laurie have actually developed. But there is clearly not a homogeneous market. It's like the poor are not homogeneous, the greens are not homogeneous. Now, how, what has driven the new urbanism? Remember, we have a charter, it's changed very little despite all attempts. We know what we're pushing, okay? And it's actually moved a very long way. Doug Farr beautifully today actually showed how, how much has been accomplished. And actually, we've gone to Michael Mahaffey's a new urban agenda of the United Nations is now the worldwide standard by the United Nations. So there's been a lot of uptake. What has been the uptake? Now, for us, we're thinking alleys, buildings, porches, form-based codes, transportation. That's what we're pushing. But over the years, what has driven it originally was market-driven. Robert Davis wanted a place that actually, in which he would, that he would love to live in. And there were enough people like him that wanted to do the same thing, that it sold. Other developers came to see, and it was actually a very good business. As Todd, Todd, Todd and Lori always find out that there's a very substantial percentage of people that are looking for this. And many, many clients just want to know whether it sells. They have no additional agenda. But nevertheless, as on the basis of this, we have actually saddled them with the entire new business agenda. So who cares why you think what the uptake is? It's that. Second, and this is incredible for the younger ones, in the 1980s, when the promise of suburbia was betrayed, NIMBYs arose, not in my backyard. Unthinkable that people wouldn't want growth. Unthinkable that you wouldn't want the shopping center or the mall or the new subdivision. In the 70s, there were no NIMBYs. In the 80s, when the promise was betrayed, and it wasn't about living in nature, and it wasn't about free driving and fantastic parking, it, the, 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 the trust was withdrawn, the NIMBY arose, and the new urbanists actually were among the people that could get permits where no one else could get a permit. And the social standard lecture that I gave with a pair of slides actually says, look how well I understand why you're a NIMBY. I understand it even better than you do, and by the way, we're not doing that. That was the play. Yes, I get it. Um, boy, am I with you. Very few, very many books were written by new urbanists, and then we said, oh, by the way, we do exactly the opposite. We're part of the solution. And that still drives it. Uh, the equity ecology driven is uh, when we gradually realized that the environmental movement arose. And by the way, now we all talk, talk, talk about it. Uh, and the sensitive souls among us have always known about the issue, but it was really Al Gore's propaganda film about 2005 that actually awoke the whole nation. And we could see that the power was eventually going to be environmentalist, and actually a greater power than money. There were several people today saying it's all about money, it's how we count, it's how we keep score, but the power is really environmentalist, the only thing that trumps the highway. Do you want to stop a highway? Find a creature that doesn't like the idea. <laughs> Don't make an argument that a human doesn't like it. Excuse me, a human. No, 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 because the economic argument. But a little bird in Southern California could stop a highway. Okay? And so we saw oh God, the environmental movement. And one of the things that, that we noticed very early on is that the tool of environmentalism was born of the urban boundary, the preservation of wilderness. 
American environmentalism was born of the preservation of wilderness. It's not like the European environmentalism. It was, you know, when environmentalism came to Europe in the late 19th century, there was no wilderness left. You couldn't look at a hillside in Italy and say, oh, it's terrible what man does, because the village was beautiful. But when you came here, you could actually tell people don't build on slopes, because men are terrible. And that arose because the American environmental movement was born of the preservation of wilderness, the western parks. And when your ideal is wilderness, the first human degrades the wilderness, the second human degrades it further. And what has happened in the United States is that environmentalism and humans are adversary. The way we measure human as tramplers and CO2 producers. Okay? And that's why the Europeans have much more sophisticated uptakes and they seem to be much more environmental, because humans are part of nature. With us, humans are not part. And the reason environmentalism is always on the defensive in this country is that you're not going to say to a human, you are the essence of all problems. You know, therefore, you must do penance. It doesn't work. But we nevertheless found that there was a danger coming on quickly, which is, since the only tool they had was nature, what they wanted to do was green the cities in the, in the, in the parks. You know, do hydrology everywhere, swales everywhere, regardless of how dense or not dense it was. And so we said, look, 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 sorry, you're bringing green everywhere, you're making urbanism impossible. And lead ND, without the incredibly good work of people like Doug Farr, would have actually been all about hydrology and prevented the building of true urbanism. And we had to push back and say, no, no, urbanism is part of the solution. People live in densely, people live in compactly insulating each other, people taking transit, that is part of the solution. If you shrub it all up and do hydrology everywhere, you spread them further. You create sprawl. And so the transit was invented as an environmental tool that was going to, that was going to bring environmental methodology used by environmentalism from the beginning to assess the city all the way in to the core. And so the city, you understand, it's a fully environmental theory. And the smart code, especially one that was actually rewritten, the, the more green ones later, are actually entirely used entirely environmental methodology. So that environmentalists actually begin to administer not only the preservation of nature, but the generation of cities, so that they understand that cities are really different from just shrugging things up. And that took on. And of course, the smart code for me, actually, it, for me, what it means, the 300 or something that Hazel has recorded, is actually the environmental sensibility that would normally have been, say, have been actually protecting the urban boundary, and only protect the urban boundary, actually coming in and questioning everything, and actually being able to assess all sorts of variables. And then health and age-driven, can't tell you how this was really came out of the new urbanism. Very early researchers at Joanna Lombard, University of Miami, the correlation between health and urbanism was a 15-year campaign, brilliantly researched, at great cost and with a lot of rigor, that I thought would be, now we've won. Because once you make the health argument, what else is there? All this was picked up. Our charter being dragged, dragged forward, dragged forward by these concerns. And then tactical and lean urbanism, after the meltdown of 2008, when everything was, involved, was actually uh, 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 revealed as not only corrupt and everything else, but bankrupt. Bankrupt, and the regulations had exploded. Lean and tactical actually took off. And then, what I'm going to speak of now is climate, but a certain kind of climate. By the way, environmentalism was not about climate. It was about preserving nature at the level of, you know, the, 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 uh, the endangered species and that kind of thing. This is, the, this, is, this is the worldwide, the first worldwide environmental, environmental um, um, uh, crisis. First thing that is local. So, one of the things that, uh, that Paul and I have been working on is that the statistics are truly awful, just beyond belief, <coughs> awful beyond belief, and they're getting worse. And every indicator is actually, and every salvation gets discarded slowly. In other words, things that are brought up, we're going to make it, and we have to keep it under 2 degrees, right? 1.5 is preferable. If you look at this, the highest historical CO2 level, and then there's the current one. You know, it's just, it's been an astonishing, astonishing jump. 
Here's another one, which is the most astonishing. This is if we follow the Paris Accord, and this poll is to keep it at what? The Paris Accord to keep it under 440, is it? What is it? Well, um, this is to reduce it to zero within 50 years. Which is Paris Accord. Okay, the Paris Accord, which is to keep it at, you know, at under two degrees, look what it looks like. We have to go back to 1900, 1930. Just the population is what? How, what multiples of that? What kind of crisis and impoverishment will get us there? Now, I don't know what you want to conclude, but I actually think that's impossible. That we're not going to make it. It's just not going to make it. Bad news, but we're not going to make it. The other one is this, what happens if we stop right now? Imagine if we stop right now and we level it. No more additional carbon whatsoever, none. Cut it off, all the carbon stays in the ground. From tomorrow on, all the, you know what Doug was saying, keep it in the ground, it still stays up there, like that, okay? That's a no further growth. And then finally, there's this one, which is actually, this is a different scale, which is actually what is likely to happen even conservatively, it just gets worse and worse and worse. The conclusion is that things aren't going to change very quickly, often the dates of the flooding of Miami. You know, the confusion that people feel actually has to do with the date. You know, when you, when you sometimes, sometimes here it's going to be six inches and sometimes six feet, it's the date. You know, people are talking about 2025 and people are talking about, you know, 200 years later. And a lot of the confusion is that. But you, if you have to normalize the dates, it's a crisis that will undoubtedly occur, but it's later. It's surprisingly late in the game. It's decades and decades and decades away. In the meantime, there are lots of earlier crises that are going to shake our society and actually uh, consume the Congress of the New Urbanism a lot earlier than the flooding of Miami. And at that point, the proposition Paul and I are making is that we should be ready to deal with the pivotal moment in which essentially it's understood that the, that the, um, irreversible tipping point has been reached. Now, as people always explain to me, it's still worth mitigating because the horror will be less. Okay, so it's still worth doing it. Got it. But I'm still, I'm speaking of this psychological point in which you say, wow, we really blew it this time. It wasn't just like the Bible said, it's something else. You know, it's a, it's a biblical event that I think will happen and it will affect. It will run through society as an enormous psychological event. And we need to study how people respond to that. Some people will party on, which is not an irrational response. <laughs> In fact, Lovelock, one who wrote the Gaia theory, actually will, oh, and this is something, I'm sorry, I have to kill your last shred of hope before I move on. <laughs> this is China. When you read that the Chinese are doing better and better and better, and you read articles, one football field of solar, you know, every two hours, or whatever the amazing statistic is. And by the way, there are counter charges, like it's taking, away, it's taking away agriculture. But that football field, they don't tell you that this is what's happening with coal at the same time. That they're still building scores and scores of power plants. They're, they separate the good news from the bad news. But the blended statistic is that everything's getting worse, even Norway. And by the way, whatever Norway does well is because they're selling the North Sea oil to somebody else. Do you understand? All the subsidies required for being Norwegian is because they externalize the burning of the oil somebody else is on somebody else's ledger. And there are wonderful experiments. This is Mazdar, the first zero carbon city. Incredible hope, our partners. Do you realize what these are at the edge? The parking garages outside the property and getting there doesn't count in the calculation. <laughs> and all the transit and everything else, everything about that, the incredible expense of having permeating transit and incredibly advanced technology everywhere is actually offloaded to selling oil to the rest of the world. If you actually calculate it, where they make the money to make this, you realize it doesn't work. And yes, there are successes, and you can argue, but essentially almost everything, as you recalculate, is punctured. And so it is going to happen, 
And more and more, there was an article yesterday in the Times in the Wall Street Journal about three news, and I wasn't, it was another, it was another, it was a website publication, that actually said there are three new organizations that are dedicated to adaptation, that are already saying, oh, we're not going to make it, let's, let's adapt. And we have to understand adaptation. <laughs> Mitigation is the first worldwide environmental crisis. It's not like the success we had with the watershed of the Hudson and the airshed of LA or all the black forests and all these successes we've had, the saving of the spotted owl. Those are local. This is the first one in which if you bicycle to work for 50 minutes a day, in those 50 minutes, 800 Audis were sold in Beijing. You see? So it isn't just about me not polluting my airshed, the whole world is actually working together. This ultimately is depressing and disempowering. Basically, what it's down to is you get a sign, go to Paris, and protest and kick some, you know, you know, kick some cobblestone around. You know, you're actually, for the worldwide environmental crisis, only the UN and the highest level of government can do it. Everybody is essentially disempowered. As I said, you're doing your job by bicycling, but what? Okay? The process of adaptation that is fascinating is that adaptation is local. You actually bring it down to your shed, your food. You say, the world's going to be in trouble, but I have my air shed, my food shed, my transportation shed, my pedestrian shed, and there's a devolution locally, which is already happening at a tremendous rate, including the sanctuary cities. You know, that is a devolution to a lower level of subsidiarity in which you're powerful again. You're not dependent on Washington. And so as soon as you bring things down to the level of the region, the new urbanism is not just one more organization like Greenpeace, you know, alerting and giving, and giving, um, and making, um, and making political contributions. No, we are suddenly front and center in the solution. And the beauty of this is that you're still doing the right thing. You're still installing the power plant, you're still growing your own food, you're still walking and doing transportation, but this time you bring it in and it's us. And I, I think one of the presentations today, it's our tribe. It's actually our tribe. Now our tribe is not necessarily ethnic, it might be generational. It's our tribe, our generation. It might be Seattle, it might be the Northwest. But there are different ways to say, and a lot, a lot of human nature, that says we'll do anything for our tribe, but not for those people across the ocean who don't even like us. On top of it, they don't like us. They don't wish us well. So while you do, and Paul and I are going to calculate this, we probably overlap 80% in doing the right thing. Because we're not going to seed the clouds with automatic drones, okay, putting pellets out. That's not obviously. We're not going to do that. We're not going to go that way. But anything that we can do, 80% of it is identical, neuroplastic identically, but it is presented differently. And it's presented and actually an intelligible and believable and trustworthy group. So, what we're proposing is that in 25 years, we are going to not only do that, but we're going to do it for a different reason. The greatest problem that has happened, and the reason there's no uptake, is that we're measuring CO2 as the evil. CO2 is the very definition of life, particularly of human life. All we do is actually create CO2. And, by the way, the wealthier we are and the longer we live, the more CO2 we produce. There's nothing worse than a rich American living to an old age. <laughs> you know what's much better? A very poor Indian dying at three of starvation. I'm sorry, but that theology is not going to be accepted by the human race. <laughs> because what happens is that the wealthiest countries actually are the best. So you can say, not just emissions per capita, we're actually looking at here, we're saying, whoa, Australia, by the way, Australia is worse than we are, just in case you're feeling good. <laughs> whoa, whoa, bad, bad, I'm sorry. I mean, last week, that was good. Good, it was good to be on this side of the ledger. It was good to be rich. It was good to live a long time. How do environmentalists think that they can reverse that and have uptake? And what makes us think that we're measuring CO2? And people say, oh yeah, 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 measure me down to poverty. You know, 
Please help me die young. I mean, come on. Okay. That's not going to work. And yet, we propose and propose. Look at this business. Okay. This is very clear. CO2 emissions per capita, right? Gross domestic product purchasing power per capita. Okay. This is good. Look how rich we are. We can buy stuff. Right? We can just buy stuff. And it has to do with emissions. Okay. And down here, what has happened is the environmentalists are, tr are attempting to reverse it. And say, oh, you know, Uganda is really tops. I mean, what can we do to get to Uganda? I mean, what are they thinking? <laughs> and so that's the resistance. The resistance is not even visceral, it's actually rational. They've never been said this boldly, but you can't really tell people that what we're measuring is a metric that the poorer you are and the younger you die, the less you will buy, the less you will eat, the less garbage you will be. The heroes are the poorest people on earth. It isn't going to work. Now, when you realize that, I don't know, but you might want to understand the explanation of why humans are not taking this up, even if it's their children and grandchildren. The measure is the wrong one. What should we, oh, by the way, this is just that monstrous baby. This is one American baby. This isn't even measuring CO2. If you start measuring stuff, just living is a huge problem. How many showers will you take? How many hamburgers will you eat? Do you know about the cattle is? Do you know the off-gassing of the cattle? You know the transportation of the cattle? So I'm just having a hamburger. You know, no. Sin, immediate. That's how I'm going to work. This is just minerals. Okay, so you get Lovelock. There's plenty of this out. Just look for it. I alert you to this emergent phenomenon. Lovelock said, enjoy life while you can in 20 years global woman with the fan. That's the Gaia theory. In the, in the late 60s, he actually identified climate change. He was early. Over here, we have, uh, this is a very recent one. This is actually uh, Hawkins. The, uh, the, you know, the great paralyzed uh, scientist who says, in the end of the world, and we know it, scientists in many disciplines see apocalypse soon. You may not uptake this, you don't, want to, you, don't want to, you don't want to face this, but it's a wave that is coming, and that wave is going to affect tremendously the CNU. And we can either be washed away with the others, and already they were saying the Greek, there was incredible altercations between green trees, <coughs> these environmental, it's already, the dissension inside the environmental movement is going to be huge, and we want to be there as the people with a solution five years from now. Again, we won't be flooded yet, but the psychology will change completely. Now, what is the possible solution? There is a, all of this was just to convince you of something, okay? We have to do a lot of persuasion before we have to speak technique in the new urbanism. Uh, the, this is the famous diagram, the most famous diagram in urban planning, of the Garden City by Ebenezer Howard. Okay? Ebenezer Howard, uh, uh, Bob Stern, two years ago, finished a book this day. 870 Garden Cities have been, have been built. People can't stop talking about it. And Emily Taylor and I got curious. Why can't they stop talking about it? All the other theories come in and out. The Garden City recurs and recurs. And we looked at this diagram closely. And what he's trying to say is the town has good and bad things. Isolation of crowds, you know, but places of amusement, good and bad, distance from work, but high money wages. So the town has good and bad things. The country has good and bad things, including boredom and not, not too many dates available at night and stuff. He talks about all this stuff, very human. And then town and country is both are good. Everything is good. He gets the good from both sides and said, if you live in a garden city, you get both. So who, in his right mind, is going to propose a, an urbanism that is in a collection of the goods? Of course the idea doesn't die. By definition, it's, it's what you want to do. And by the way, the lists have changed, but the lists are always, the whole premise is you combine the goods. So if you want to combine the good, what goes wrong? What goes wrong is the imbalance. So you get this, for example. If, now, remember, the Garden City, the beauty and with the most memorable thing about the Garden City is that there had to be a balance between the population in the urban area and the, the, the green belt that fed it. And if you extend it to a modern set of things, 
and you have balanced populations, singles and families, older and younger, wealthier and less so, requiring care, supportive care, workers and jobs, jobs have some balance, national businesses, local businesses, local agriculture, local consumption, waste recycling, waste, importation, local manufacturing, everything that we ever talk about is good. We only get in trouble when it's off balance when there's too much water, or not enough water, or nothing but young people, or nothing but old people, or nothing but poor people. You know, Carol Coletta gave a fantastic speech last time uh, that, uh, that actually said, you know, a very small percentage of the cities have a problem with gentrification. Most cities can't wait to have some housing that pays taxes. Do you see what I'm saying? So what's good? You need to have the balance. You need affordable housing and you need the other. And so this thing comes from Ebenezer Howard, and we did a take on it that said, if balance is the ideal, every bit of balance, of imbalance, of every module of imbalance, let's say 20%, eventually gets you the deviation from self-sufficiency. So this one has a deviation of 40. It's 40 points off self-sufficiency. And the idea is that this is the unified criteria in which all political decisions or personal decisions are made to nudge. Like when you make a decision about a school or kids or this or that, you say, the elected officials, everybody says, let's nudge it to balance. It's actually, it's what a comprehensive plan should be. Comprehensive plan should actually nudge the place. It'll always be off balance, but at least we have an ideal. And this is what we measure. And what this adds up to is content. It adds up to human happiness. And it happens sort of to a very high degree of resiliency, which is actually adaptation. So what happens is we get 80% of the mitigation, we get all of the adaptation, we get an intelligent, unified political agenda, et cetera, et cetera, and it's all about a better life. You're leading a better life. Now, this is associated with subsidiarity, which is, and many people said, including Doug Clark, the decision should be at the level of the neighborhood. Boy, is that in the air. You know, everybody bringing it down to the most local level that can competently make the decision. The most local level. Very American, actually. And except that instead of just the feds, this, the state of the city, there is the household, the block, the neighborhood, the city, the county, the, the country, and the UN. At the very least. There's also the condominium associations, etc. And the decision that is to be made is not to make the decision on a charrette, but to decide what level is to make the decision on that particular matter. So the really intelligent thing is not to pretend that in a charrette, oh, we're going to decide how it's going to go. No. You say, that issue you have, can you solve it at the level of the block? Can parking be solved at the level of the block? Can having domestic chickens be at the level of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the lot, or is it the block, or is it the neighborhood? And every decision suddenly gets intelligent. Because we're usually making the decisions at the lowest level. And one of the things that's happening now is the right used to love the lowest level of subsidiarity, and now the left is beginning to get a taste for it with the sanctuary cities. Because when we don't like the feds in Washington, what you want to do is bring power down. We, this bridges, we've already tested it, this bridges left and right. The decision will be as local as possible. And the decisions, we found this diagram, has to do with the shed. I didn't realize, I didn't realize I, mean, I thought this was all about decision making in, in the sense of the political. I just imagined the meeting, that the meeting would be at the of the block. And yet, every decision is geographic, it's the shed. Every one of these implies, you know, there's the airshed, like, where's your electric grid? Where's your electricity coming from? Canada. Oh, I get it. Well, that's part of your, jet, your shed. So, adaptation isn't just, as people keep repeating, oh, let's build medieval cities with walls. No, it depends. I mean, at some level, you have to have a perimeter somewhere, whether it's your house or your block or whatever it is. But basically, every shed is different. And the, and the new urbanism can begin talking about the many things that we have to talk about that interest us in terms of sheds. If this kind of rational thing is ever presented to people when this happens, it will, we believe, grant us moral authority. Another topic that is everywhere in the air. Uh, Doug Farr presented it. Remember when we signed the thing, we shall not do, do, do scroll? It was, it's been mentioned in three or four lectures, including John and Roses. He said, we can only change things with moral authority. 
And actually, the point that's being made, change only happens from a position of moral authority. It does not happen from power. Okay. The American War of Independence was premised on moral authority. Washington was all about moral authority. Lincoln was all about moral authority. Martin Luther King was all about moral authority. These were not powerful people, but they, they were on the right. We have an incredible capacity for moral authority. The question is, what is it based on? What are we going to base it on? And that's an open question that we need, we've, we've been discussing. Is moral authority going to be based on CO2? Is it going to be punitive? Or is it like Kunstler's book? And there's something about like Kunstler's book I'd like to say. When this came out, it predicted everything that went, that went and would go wrong. And people say, it was too depressing to read. And when people tell me that, I say, yes, but that's because you didn't finish it. And he says, that's right, I didn't finish it. Because in the end, the last chapter is a beautiful chapter that says, when all this falls apart and everything is removed, all the overload of excessive wealth and stupidity, our daily lives will be better. The pleasure of opening a window instead of depending on a machine, the pleasure of walking to your bread, the pleasure of fishing for your dinner, and all these things were presented as pleasure. So it's a beautiful vision that was painted in the last chapter. And that is what we should aim for. It's not a punishment, actually, to live in an adaptive community if we have the right attitude. Remember how we used to say, if you design a plaza that happens to have cars in it, it's a plaza. If you design a parking lot, even when the cars are gone, it's still going to be a parking lot. It's the model that you have in mind. If we want to build a, a places that are absolutely dedicated to having a better day, notice how unambitious that is, from the megalomania of let's save the world. Oh, the new urban is going to save the world. No, 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 excuse me. What about having a good day? <laughs> okay, so that you can go to the bar at night, nice little affordable bar instead of going to go shopping, you know, little things like that. No, you don't need to do Nikes because you know what? You're, etc. Um, <laughs> that we are fully, we are masters. We are lords of that. And that is exactly the scale that we can deliver. Not that megalomaniac scale, which actually is not only, to my ears, already sounds absurd but actually is not going to work anyway. And yet the effect is the same. I'm talking about positioning. I'm not talking about actually that the difference is the same. It's how we present ourselves. Now, we need to do some tech work. But look, more and more you see this. Look at this. This is fantastic ice cream. It has less sugar. Great. I know. I'm, you're not going to have triple glazed. No, we're finishing time. OK. But with a it's a great non-profit, great non -profit. your taste buds and your planet both win with this deal. <laughs> <laughs> and it happens to be great ice cream. Okay, now you beat that. Who's going to say no to that? No one's going to say no to that. But we cannot join the piling on of the bad news. This is uh, that set of pairs that we actually have, which is a technical document that needs to be fleshed out, can actually read it this way. Look at this. Urban research should approach a balanced population of younger and older people, of wealthier <laughs> residents and those less so, of those who work and those who must be cared for. A balanced economy of workers and the corresponding jobs, of local and national businesses, of local agriculture and local consumption, of the manufacture and the importation of goods. You still import goods. You're not going to get a good suit locally. Okay? But you're going to have your suit repair locally. You don't have to throw it out. Of, of local manufacturing imported goods, of energy generation and its level of consumption, of water supply and the requirement for it, a balanced communication of walking and wheeled vehicles, of private and public transit, of sociable places and telecommunications. Okay, if you're all going to do Facebook, you're going to be in your bubble. But you know, notoriously, when you meet somebody at the bar, you might actually like them and have actually more intelligent argument. Oh, a balanced urban pattern of self-built and production housing, of craft and high-tech building technology. It isn't going to be just leave high-tech. It also needs to be the original greens, both, but in balance, as opposed to the absolute overwhelming dominance of lead. 
which is, which is full of consultants and full of high tech and extremely expensive. Of urbanized areas and open spaces, of neighborhood and regional social services, of housing and schooling, of commercial enterprises and civic institutions, of recreational and cultural gathering places, of buildings both durable and mutable. Not just what we saw, cheap buildings and then the ones that last forever. You know, something that actually depends on the building. A balanced governance of collective and private initiative, which is what LEAN is, private initiative, of public order and individual freedom, of top-down and participatory protocols. We also need top-down government. It isn't just going to bubble up because then we can never get the power lines built. Okay, the power lines require something at a state level. Now, this is actually a prescription of a very nice place. And when you say, what can be against it, it's very difficult to say. There's something very natural, very inevitable, very physical about this. And you say, well, but that's what you're after. That's why the decision should be driven. Can you actually say, does that, is that enough to grant us moral authority? And so that's the proposition that I think we should be working towards in the next five years. Something that is both simple and complex, but above all, with incredible amount of stickiness and uptake, and then it will drive our Europeanist agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Andres, as usual, deviated from the prescribed program. Three minutes. Uh, but I don't think anyone is going to complain. Uh, Paul, do you want to have any, any... <laughs> I think that Andres and I talked a lot about with our um, military grade laser pointers. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, a, a number of my friends have approached me in the halls um, just in passing and they've said, uh, not just adaptation, adaptation and mitigation. And then gone and I haven't had a chance to to respond to that um, and I, I could say that you you stand among giants in in saying that we need to adapt and mitigate um, I was convinced by one of those giants to focus on adaptation um, and it was Burton Richter who wrote the book uh, Smoke and Mirrors um, a very experienced physicist, and um, he would go through a chapter saying how it's going to be impossible to get CO2 back concentrations back below 350. It's going to keep rising, and then he would say at the end, "But we must mitigate at all costs." Yeah, right. That's the argument I always hear. Always, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're not going to make it, but we must mitigate. And the argument is that you can actually make it less bad. But I'm not speaking about that. I'm speaking about the, the crisis, the cultural crisis, when we realize we're not going to make it. How do we ride that? How, do, how does that empower us towards our agenda? Okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen. There are drinks on the other side of those doors. <laughs>